The word gospel translates to news that brings joy. But this isn't just any news. A gospel is news that changes a life forever. After being invaded and enslaved by Persia, Greece won two decisive battles at Marathon and Solnus. The Greeks sent out heralds, also called evangelists, to proclaim the good news to the cities. We have fought for you, we have won, and now you're no longer slaves, you're free. The reality is that we are all slaves, slaves to sin and slaves to death. We are slaves in need of good news. Enter Jesus, God's Son, fully God, fully man, bringing news that would change our lives forever. His news was this, I am the divine, come to you to do what you could not do for yourself. I will take what you deserve so you can have what I deserve. You have no idea how much it will cost me, but you also cannot imagine the depths of my love for you. It is a gift that I give freely, so repent. Repent from all the ways you've run from me and follow me. Follow me because I am the only way to eternal life. Follow me because I'm the savior you've been looking for. Follow me because I have authority over everything, yet I have humbled myself for you. Follow me because I died on a cross for you, because I'm your true love and your true life. This is my good news for you. This is my gospel that you have been saved by grace and that you are slaves no more. Praise God, amen. <laughs> amen, buddy. Go amen corner over there. I'm gonna have to pay him in uh, vanilla wafers after this is over. <laughs> It's so good just to be a part of what God's doing, amen? amen. Uh, and and I, I just want to give you permission this morning. Look around the room with me. Look at the beautiful faces. Look at the beautiful church that God has given us, amen? I want to give God applause for what he's done in our church, amen? Um, you know, I, I grew up in church. I'm so grateful to God that my parents had me on their knee at church just like this little man over here when I was his age and raised me up in a godly environment. And we need to be doing that. Amen? Um, amen? amen? We need to be doing that. We need to be leading our children to Christ, our grandchildren. We need to be sowing the seeds of the gospel that we're going to talk about this morning. And I also, I want to challenge us and I want to encourage us not to take for granted the name of Jesus Christ. Because Scripture tells us that that is the name above all names. Um, I, I was at annual conference, as Brother Steve mentioned, and it was so refreshing to be at a conference of our church, of our precious saints and lay people and pastors and clergy, and, and just to be there and be able to worship the Lord completely breathing the same spiritual air of a new denomination that believes as we do biblically. And it just filled my tank up with God. And I'm so glad of where he has positioned our churches and our church and where Jesus is taking us. Um, and one of the stories that was told really impacted me. It was a, a pastor, um, and I, I want to have him here. He, uh, he's got a ministry of prayer. And, um, but he, he shared a story. He said he was preaching, and there was a, uh, a lady that had started coming to their church. Um, I believe her name was Susan. And um, he noticed when he was preaching, every time he mentioned the name Jesus, the lady got very emotional. And um, to the point where, after about four or five times of just using Jesus in the sermon, that she got up and had to leave because she was crying so much. And the pastor immediately he thought, oh no, I've, I've, maybe I've said something in my sermon that offended her. What have I said? You know, I, something didn't go the right way maybe. And so after the service he found her and he said, Susan, I, I'm so sorry. Evidently I've offended you that you had to leave the service and were crying. And she said, Pastor, it wasn't you. It's just that 
the name of Jesus means so much to me that every time you say it, I can't help but cry. And he said, really? She said, yeah. She said, two years ago, I sold my soul to the devil. She said, I was a prostitute in this part of near College Station in Texas where the church was. And she said that <clears throat> one night I told Satan if he would help me find a vein where I could shoot up more heroin than I would give him my soul. And immediately a vein popped up. And I stuck that vein with heroin. She said two weeks after that I was in a box car at the train yard. And I knew I was going to die. And I called out to the name of Jesus. And he saved me. And at that moment, I was completely set free from drug addiction. She said, there is something about that name. And I can't say his name or hear his name without crying because he has saved my life. And, and the pastor told that story because he said, why don't we cry? I know, like you and like me, there's a lot of noise pollution in our world, a lot of chatter, a lot of names. But we need to remember there is one name above all names. And that name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That is the name that has saved our soul. Whether we're in a box car or wherever, he is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, at the epicenter of what we believe as Christians is the gospel. And uh, this word gospel, it means good news. And the, the number one reason why it is the good news is because it's God's news. And, and you know this God's news. If you could encapsulate it and put it into a scripture, one scripture, it would be a scripture that we all know, that you've heard me preach on many times, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's interesting here, that the very beginning of this sets the stage. For God so loved that he gave. That's what love is, right? It's giving. But God didn't just give anything, but he gave his only son. So that whoever would believe, we would not perish, but we would have eternal life. And you and I are recipients of that grace. Because that gospel truth changes everything. Everything, everything in your life and in my life. Because the love of God, our creator, came to this world. He put on skin 2,000 years ago. He walked a mile in our sandals. He didn't just come to be an example and walk a mile in our sandals, but he came on a rescue mission to lay his life down, as the video just shared, so that we could partake in the grace of the Father's relationship through the access, as we talked about recently, the access of Jesus Christ through our faith. It's a gift, but we have to receive it through faith of saying, yes, I believe, I receive for me. And therefore, we live and we move in a whole new way. We have a, a whole new way to be human. And, and in this relationship with the Almighty God, if, if you choose to receive Jesus Christ, you, you this morning that are tuned in and live streaming with us, you have a choice there in your PJs on the couch. Will you receive Jesus Christ? It's not a coincidence that you've tuned in, but God is speaking to you right there with the blue pajamas. God loves you. And you need to know that. And we need to know that. We need to understand that. And because it's through the lens of this relationship that our life has changed. Something happens supernaturally. It's not just a, a natural thing where we decide, but more importantly, it's a God supernatural thing where God starts to come inside of us, the Scripture says. And we receive the Holy Spirit. It is a deposit guaranteeing things to come. And essentially, God outgrows our skin through the power of the Holy Spirit. The old you, the BC, begins to leave and go away as you yield more of your life to Jesus Christ. Old Mr. Potty Mouth the one who used to cuss and, and lose his temper, those desires and those habits and those appetites are eclipsed by the power of God of holiness and integrity. Amen? <clears throat> Amen? Amen? Just four of y'all said it to begin with. I want to make sure we're all on board here. Um, but, but things change in our life. Uh, we learn new things about God 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. Such as, I'm learning that God is patient with me and my screw-ups when I make mistakes every day and I fail and I sin. But because of God's mercy and patience with me, I want to be patient with others. I want to bear God's image. And, and we see this amazing mix of supernatural of God and natural of us coming together under one human roof called the you, called the church. And then God mobilizes us, strategically places us in our community to share the light of Christ, and the world is changed. The world is changed. Because as Christ followers, we become vessels and vehicles of God that God gets in through the ignition of faith, puts the key in there, and drives our life to do His will wherever He wants to so that His kingdom can truly come here on earth as it is in heaven. In Limestone County, right here, as we just got through prayed. But for all of this to happen, this chain reaction of the gospel, taking root through the power of the Holy Spirit, changing your sphere of influence, you moving from B.C. to a new man or a new woman in Christ, for all of this to happen, we have to use, we have to employ, we have to own, we have to partner with faith, believing God to accomplish the impossible in our lives every day. And without faith, everything else stalls. Without faith, everything in your life will stall. And I know this because the Scripture tells us in Hebrews eleven six 6, that without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Faith is the kingpin. It is the thing, the gas in your tank as a Christian. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's why we're preaching on faith, about unsheathing your faith like a sword. As you've heard me say, the sword on the battlefield does you no good if it remains in its sheath. You as Christians are called to unsheath your faith. Whenever life happens, which is every second, so you insert faith into the equation of whatever you're facing, good, bad, or ugly, whatever. You insert your faith. Say, God is here. God is with me. This is not the end. God is faithful, God is teaching me, God is showing me the Holy Spirit is inside of me, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, the Scripture tells me. So, so this morning, as we try to do every Sunday, I, I try to take a biblical truth, and we try to bring it down to a level where we can all sink our teeth into it. Because I believe it's important to get practical with God's Word. Because Jesus said, He who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. It's not enough to hear the Word. We've got to also respond to the Word and get it into our life. Are you with me, church? Are y'all really with me? You're not kidding, are you? I mean, you're really with me, right? Amen. Amen. I was just saying that, so I had an extra second to get some water. I really believe you're with me. Um, <clears throat> but I want to bring this truth home a bit today. God gives us the gift of relationship so we understand the Father's love, okay? Relationships are connecting, and God gave us this human framework, this human system of relationships, what we have in this room, so that we can understand not just love for each other and love for our neighbor, which is second grace commandment, but more importantly, we understand the number one commandment of loving God with all of our heart, okay? Number one, love God with all of our heart. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And that happens through the human framework of relationships. So when, when we get to know God, things change. And we see life through God's glasses, if you will, God's vision. I see people differently. I see life. And we learn new things together. This, these relationships with each other and with God introduces us to new things. Such as um, God introduced me through His grace to a primary relationship in my life, a human relationship, my relationship with my wife. And I thank God for that, amen? God sovereignly brought us together, just like God brought Eve to Adam, and, and, and God took care of that. And by the way, in your relationships, you need to realize God is the matchmaker, you're not, amen? Now listen to me, you know, um, God brought Eve to Adam, and that's the plan. So what your job is, if you're a, a, a man or a woman that's looking for a godly spouse, your focus should not be on trying to find the godly spouse. Your focus should be on putting God number one in your life. And if you do that, I promise you, God will take care of the rest. Amen? It's kind of like a, a triangle. If you're on one side and she's on the other, if you both focus on God, guess what? You're going to meet. And likewise, the other side of that coin is that if you start beating the bushes, something scary might come out. Amen? <laughs> 
I mean, let's be real. We, we've, it's happened, man. And so trust God. Don't beat those bushes. Say, Lord, you're the matchmaker. And so just trust God with that. So that, that's a, there's a whole story there that we'll talk about sometime. But God sovereignly brought me my wife and um, beautiful wife of 28 years. And Angela was born in uh, Pensacola. Her dad was a Navy corpsman in the military. She was born at Pensacola Naval Air Station, but she spent a large part of her life, uh, approximately a decade, on the mission field in Guatemala, as you've heard. Um, Guatemala at that time, when they were there, was ravaged by war, um, and there were a lot of orphans and widows, and they, there was a ministry started, Living Water Ministries, to, and they, they were feeding at one time about 4,000 children a month with several feeding programs, pastoring churches, and, and all this God work that I'm so honored for her. But I, I say that to say that her um, Spanish culture and influence, even though she's American and everything, uh, I started hearing more about frijoles after we were born because she loves some, some good uh, Spanish cuisine and Spanish culture, and, and it just, man, I started hearing things like, you know, frijoles and, and piñatas was one of those things. And so um, I knew about piñatas, but man, we started having piñatas at every birthday. I mean, Angela's like, she was looking for an excuse to get a piñata. Oh, I'll get a piñata for that, you know? Okay, I love you, honey. Oh, I'll get a piñata for that. You know, this is great. We have piñatas coming out of our ears, which is great. I like piñatas. They're fun. You know, you fill them with candy and you hit them. And, you, and, and so that has a lot to do with my, my sermon today, believe it or not. I mentioned that because... I remember one year, uh, Angela and I had been married about three or four years um, in Tuscaloosa there, and, um, and they were having a birthday party for me. It was my birthday. And, and so Angela, um, what she wanted to do was to have a pinata. Look, true enough, man, it happened. And the thing about the, the place where my mom and dad lived at the time in Northwood Lake was that um, the, the, the houses, a lot of times in that neighborhood, there was a lot of steep, steep hills. And so the house was up on the hill, which meant a very long um, very uh, steep incline of a, of a concrete driveway, okay? So we had to go way up, and, and I remember our, our carport was so that when you were going up the carport, you couldn't even see the carport for a second or two until you went into it. It was so high up, and unfortunately, true story, there was a girl in my neighborhood in my, when I was in high school there at County High, Tuscaloosa County High, and she had been sunbathing in, at her house a few blocks over, but it had the same kind of uh, ascent. And she was sunbathing, and her mom or her dad didn't see her, and they, they ran over her. It killed her. A fatal situation, terrible tragedy. But that's how steep these driveways were, just like mine. And so for, we didn't have a lot of flat ground, but they wanted to do the pinata for me, so they put it in the garage, uh, in the carport, and they parked the car strategically with the emergency brake on down the hill so that we had a little place to have a party there, uh, I remember. And, um, and, and it, was, it was a lot of fun. We had a, a great time. Um, but, but I remember what we did was um, they, they put the pinata in the, in the garage there for me in, in the open air garage, and, and we were all there, the whole family. And so what they do, as you know, with the pinata is they blindfold somebody, and they blindfolded me. And because I was, you know, I'm kind of, we like to have fun and yuck it up. My, my brother-in-law said, no, he's not blindfolded good enough. And you know how it is. So they start like, I don't know if he used duct tape or whatever, but he was just plastering my eyes. I could not see anything at all. I mean, my... My eyeballs are still smushed in my cranium from what he did to me, probably. But then he, he would wrap, and I couldn't see a thing. And he had all these black socks or bandanas around my head. I don't look like a mummy. Um, and then they start to go spinning me, right, like a human top. And so they start spinning me, spinning me. And I get motion sick pretty fast, as it is. But, but you know the way they spin you, they spin you, they spin you, they spin you. And then your brother-in-law gets involved and says, oh, he's not ready yet. So he keeps spinning me, spinning me, spinning me, spinning me, and spinning me really good. And, and so as, as they put a stick in my hand and they get their hands on my shoulders, my brother-in-law does, and he says, okay, he's ready, let go. As soon as he let go of me, I immediately dove to my left and I started going down the concrete driveway. And it was, and, and I don't know if you've ever been spun like that, but you, you're out of control. You, you can't stand up straight. And immediately, I just, I don't know why I went to the left or whatever, but I start barreling down the concrete driveway. And, and like in any good action movie, several things simultaneously happened at that moment. I heard a palpable gasp by my mom. I heard two or three shrieks from people that were in the garage. <gasps> oh no! Ah! And, all, and I think I probably said something inaudibly like, Bleh. 
as I'm trying to figure out what is going on with my world. Why can't I control my legs? Why is it dark? Why am I going? And I was running by this time. I mean, you know, I'm trying to catch up on my feet, and I'm, I'm, I'm not just going on level ground. I'm going down a concrete driveway. And at the bottom of the hill, there's two huge yucca plants, like, like oasis of cactuses on the right and the left of the driveway. And this is 30,000 feet down at the bottom of the hill. So it seemed. And I'll be honest with you, there was a, another hill to the left there of a perpendicular traffic going off this hill, flying down in front. And I'm just thinking, well, I'm going to get to meet Jesus today. Uh, and all this stuff was happening so fast in, in my head. Then seemingly after hours, but it was just a few seconds, of feeling like I was derailed train on this roller coaster that I wanted to get off, I came to rest violently in the root and branch structure of my mom's rose bush. And, and I don't know, I mean, I'm not talking a small rose bush. This is probably in the Guinness Book of World Records somewhere. And I remember, I remember thinking, I'm going to hit something real hard any second now, and I can't control it. And so I barreled into that with my side of my head and my right shoulder and just plowed into it like a meteorite. And that all happened in about three seconds, but it, it seemed like it went on forever. And as I came to my, they all ran over there and they're like checking for broke bones and everything. As I came to my senses, you know, I, I was like, where were y'all? Why did y'all do this to me? You know, I'm thinking they were trying to kill me and this is the great opportunity to do that. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but I remember yelling at them. I was mad as a hornet. Why, why did y'all not stop me? And my dad, he, he said what everybody was thinking. And this is interesting. He said, you dodged the cars so well that we thought you could see where you were going. And I said, no! <laughs> and, and honestly, they said, you wouldn't believe it unless we had shown a video of this, how I had dodged the cars. And, and I had to chalk that up to my guardian angel that was guarding me like an NBA player, right? I mean, he was like, whoa, don't go there, don't, whoa, don't go there, don't go there. Boom, hit the rose bush. But I thank God for guardian angels, amen? Amen, I, I'm telling you. I share that, that painful story with you, and I thank God that I lived through it. Um, because it could have been a lot worse. And I know we've all had close calls like that when you're like, wow, thank God. Wow, thank God. But, but I share this harrowing story with you this morning because like the sledgehammer last week and, and like the sword the week before that, and there's a spiritual lesson here because some people have what I call pinata faith. Pinata faith. Like reflexive faith, it's a term that I've coined to capture where some folks are today in their walk with Jesus. And it has a lot to do with our sermon scripture text today. If you will stand with me out of reverence for the reading of God's word, because everything comes from God's word for us. And this is from the New Testament book of James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God, and to this we say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Like the picture that James paints in Scripture and the pinata story that I lived, uh, that I just shared with you, one thing that they both have in common is with some Christians, there is a profound sense of aimless faith. Aimless faith. In James, the half-brother of Jesus, he, he tells us that as believers in God, we have to not just hear the word, but radically and intentionally do what it says. If not, we are so aimless and visionless, and we lack the focus to the point that we even forget what we ever look like. Likewise, because of the blindfold in my story and the people and the circumstances around me, I was perilously aimless, headed for rosebush, prickly destruction in my life. 
And, and it really, to be honest with you, these stories put the fear of God in me. Because there are Christians out there who say they have faith with their mouth, but they let their world and their circumstances steer them aimlessly like an anchorless ship on the high seas, like a pinball in the machine of life or a spinning top that is out of control because their faith is baseless. They choose to have no divine bearing. And because of that, not only is their faith, their steering mechanism aimless, but their life is out of control because they say they have faith, but their faith is truly not rooted in God or His Word. Have you ever been in a situation where you're out of control? Yeah, it happens to each one of us in different ways. <clears throat> I remember a story years ago. I was, um, uh, my, my buddy, my best friend at the time, we were in high school. He had just gotten his new, his first car. It was his first new used car, his old Ford Escort. And, and I was 15, he was 16. And I don't know how my parents let me do this, but we decided to go on a road trip down to Florida during the summer. And so they went, we went down to New Smyrna Beach, which was, it still is, the shark bite capital of the world. You can Google it, not during the sermon. New Smyrna Beach on the east coast of Florida. Um, I got 12 stitches in my head from a surfing accident that I'll tell you about sometime. Um, God thing there as well. But, but one night late, we had this wild hair that we were going to visit his relatives. Um, that We were staying in New Smyrna with his uncle and aunt, but we were going to go down to Orlando. And it's not just a short drive. But we being the young teenagers that were invincible at the time, we thought we could do this. So we left one night late on our way to Orlando. And as somewhere in the drive, somewhere in that journey, um, it, it got really bad. Because, and, and let me just say this, I don't know if you remember the cassette tapes. Remember in the 80s, these, these, we would make our own cassette tapes of the, our favorite songs or whatever. And, and I had messed up the tape or something, and, and there was a 13-second lull between songs. And, and after that 13 seconds of quiet between the songs, there was a song that came on by Banana Ram at the time. It was an old song about Venus, you know, God is on the mountain top. You know that song? I don't know if you know that song. I'm not going to dance. Trust me, it's a song. Um, but, but it came on really loud. So what had happened was we were driving. I was in the passenger seat. Daniel was driving his car. And I fell asleep. I'm the passenger. It's probably 11 o'clock at night. And I fell asleep. So we're driving. And Daniel, being the driver, he fell asleep. And the reason why I know this is because after the 13-second lull in the tape, it said, God is on the mountain. It woke me up, the word God. And I remember, huh, and I looked at Daniel, and Daniel was like this. As God is my witness, I remember looking at him. I guess my reflexes were better, and he was like this. And I remember his hair was just hanging back. And I yelled... And he looked at him, and he looked at me, and then there was a metal guardrail, as God is my witness, that we were, I don't know how close we were. I don't know if we were going 70 miles an hour or what, but if, if it would have been one tiny millisecond more, we would have hit that metal guardrail, and it would have gone off into this culvert that I couldn't even see the bottom of. You can't tell me that that's a coincidence. You can't convince me. <laughs> I don't care if you believe it or not. I know God saved our life. And it just, the word just happened to be God that we heard, that's not a coincidence. But I share that with you because, unfortunately, I think that's the way a lot of Christians are on the highway of life. They feel good about their walk with God. They're in the driver's seat, but they are asleep at the will. It's interesting to me when I, when I read this scripture um, that, that the word James uses is, talks about looking intently into the perfect law, which gives life, gives freedom. You know, there's a lot of Christians that just look casually at God's word. They don't look intently. They don't make it their life. They don't own it the way they should. You know, how many Christians have fallen asleep? Have you fallen asleep in certain areas of your life with God? Because God has called you to a trajectory with him that you have to maintain i have to maintain and there's another way to look at this too how many christians have allowed things to hijack their faith hijack their faith 
like, like the world around them. You know, and what they have is, is something I just coined recently, chicken little faith. You know chicken little? Remember the big red hen? And chicken, chicken little was, oh my gosh, the world's coming, the world's falling, right? And everything that happens, they freak out about. Do you know why? Because instead of letting God steer their faith, they let their emotions. And their Christian walk is only as strong as their emotions are. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that's a weak faith. That's a faith that will not stand in a world that's trying to throw everything against you. As we unpacked last week, God has another plan for you and I. A plan for you and I to be overcomers in the world. Overcomers in a world that has succumbed to the undertow of culture and despair. So how do we live this out? How do we unsheath our faith? How do we live this god purpose for us to be the God-sized lights in a dark world? Well, James tells us that we let God be our vision. Not the world, not the headlines, not your circumstances, not your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, not your boss, not your colleagues. They are not your vision. Jesus Christ is your vision. God's truth is our vision. What happened with Peter when he took his eyes off of Jesus when he was walking on water? What happened to Peter? He started to sink. Why? Because he looked at the waves and the wind and the rain instead of looking at Jesus. But Jesus was still there to grab him and pick him up. Amen? Have you ever heard the song, Be Thou My Vision? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. That's the vision, amen? Waking or sleeping, thy presence, thy word thy love letter called scripture if we let god call the shots not our emotions not the headlines not the tyranny of the urgent not the constant stream of stress or the deluge of despair if you are in his word daily then your life will be different than those around you psalm 119 105 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path if you live it if you memorize it, if you eat God's word, if you process on it, marinate on it, stand on it, then the Bible becomes who you are. You will be the light to a world spinning out of control. And that's the plan. So that when those precious ones around you are blindfolded and spinning down a concrete driveway, you will grab them and rescue them from the impending disaster unlike my brother-in-law. <laughs> On the other hand, if you embrace a self-preservation form of aimless pinata faith that plays it safe, that chooses the defensive over being Christ-like in the offensive, if you choose to stay in the boat when God beckons you out on the sea, then the church will be boarded up. And your witness will fatally hibernate. And Jesus Christ did not give his life for that church. He gave his life for those that would believe. Amen? He gave it for those that will not believe as well. But we have a purpose and a choice to believe and receive the truth of God. You do not want your light, like the world, to grow dim around you. So why am I sharing this message with you today? Because if you're living a strong faith Everyone, including yourself, will know it. Not because you're perfect, but because you will have a confidence that only comes from God's throne room, no matter what the world throws at you. So how is your faith? Is it relentless? Is it focused, regardless of the results? Or is it a faith that is short-sighted and self-driven? Philip Yancey said, Faith is doing things that only make sense in reverse. Chew on that. It's time for us to live the gospel, a 
of Jesus Christ, church. God has put breath in your lungs for such a time as this. Like it or not, we're the ones that God is going to use to change the world in the darkest days. And I'm excited. As you've heard me say, God could have put breath in your lungs 400 years ago in outer Mongolia, but he chose to put you in the game now. So your job is to shine in his reflection. Your job is to live the gospel truth to turn this world right side up with a hope that is bigger than us and a faith that is forged for such a time as this. Let us pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth and what you're doing in our life and that you are up to the task and that you are inside of us. Lord, I pray that we will no longer embrace a pinata faith that spins around like a top that is aimless and baseless. But Lord, we will have our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ, the stability of your word, and the hope that God is with us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's stand together.